affected by the roof damage leak. And we have this problem of knowing what to do about the crown molding. So I'm going to see how easy that is to come down and how much care it's going to take. Um, preferably we'd like to save it, but don't actually know if it is actually um, original to the house. So we're going to take a look at it. get a piece of it off in one piece, a little bit broken, and I actually broke a little bit up there too. It's probably original, and it also looks like it's one piece, so not unlike the door trim that um, is made up of several different pieces together to make that beautiful profile. This is one piece, and somebody has labeled it East, so... handwriting of the 1900s? I don't know. <laughs> so more research will need to be done to know that this is original. Maybe there's some more clues. But it is lovely. I don't know how feasible it is to get it all down without too much damage. So maybe we'll give it a try. Seems worth it. in our numbering, we'll have a map of where the trim goes. Oops, I guess that's this side, isn't it? Yep. Make sure we know that it's on the inside. Yeah, okay. see this chunk of ceiling has the original lathe and plaster and then under it ceiling is modern day well semi-modern day drywall what we're finding is that this is the some of the early drywall that's been put on over the original lathe and plaster and together this combination weighs 5.6 pounds per square foot and on the first floor, we've got about 1,100 square feet. That works out to 6,160 pounds of ceiling here. We get the ceiling out of here, I don't know, the house might float away. All right, well, that's that's one stripe across the ceiling. We had water dripping out of that. Still wet up in the cavity like we expected. It needs to be opened up in order to dry it out completely. So, regrettably, all of this ceiling, this old ceiling is gonna have to come down. And having taken just one stripe across there, you can see there's a pretty big mess. So, I'm gonna clean that up and that's not a very exciting video, so. Original drywall, there was wallpaper. I'm gonna set this piece aside for Lindsay.
original living room wallpaper for Lindsay. Well, where the trim is, it's underneath the layer of newer sheetrock. You look up there, there's the lathe, then original plaster, then sheetrock, like, drywall, and then there's another layer of wet plaster over the drywall, which is not modern construction technique. And then this seems to be abutting that, so it was put on after that last. Yeah, it was put. Plaster was put on. Yeah, it was, you know, it could have been taken down and put back or. Maybe that's why it has labels on it. What does it have on it? It has labels on it. Oh, yeah. Well, that okay. could that explains be. it. Let's carry on. problem by removing these walls and ceilings. Got all the crown molding out. Salvaged a big percentage of it. But over here, along this wall, the cabinets are gonna go to the ceiling, so we don't might not have to worry about a crown molding up there, so we just have to maybe figure out how to trim the cabinets out. Woohoo! Alright. 
Brand new, starting from zero. How many thousands of kilowatt hours have we used? None. Zero. Aw, brand new. It's like getting a new car. So the electricity is coming into the house through that one mm -hmm. from the city into this main box. What's this main box called? This is the shutoff, the main shutoff. Into this main shutoff, so. It electrical circuit breaker. Okay. And then what happens from there is it comes out of there down this very secure conduit. Into an electrical gutter. It's an electrical gutter. That box. Why do you need an electrical gutter? Well, because we're going to route lots of wires through there. You see it comes in there. Yeah. And then mysteriously another <laughs> comes conduit out comes there. out of it. And stuff happens in here? Stuff happens in there. Connections happen in there. Connections, okay. Connections that are not protected. So is this like one line that comes yes. in and comes out many different lines? Comes out, it can, actually comes out in two places right now. Okay. One comes out and goes to the sub panel. Okay. Which, what's the sub panel? That's the, the one upstairs. It's in the entryway upstairs. Okay. That splits the load on on the panels so that part of the house load can be on this one, part of it can be on that one. Okay. And it's not interrupted except by the main breaker. So main breaker in, line in. Right. Something happens in here. inside and you don't want to put your fingers in there. Never. As long as this is on, it's that's live. hot in there. Which it is now. Which it is now. As of this morning. Right. So this goes up and goes to the sub panel. Okay. And another one comes out here and goes to the panel here in the basement. To this panel. This sub panel. at the moment has only two circuits on it. Okay. Two 20 amp, see they're labeled on the handle. Okay. Two 20 amp circuits and those are just these two plugins right here. Each one's a separate circuit. And one has the light on it and one has where we're going to, we're plug, going to plug in, in our, our electric car. So what's going to go on this sub panel? And why do we have them? Why do we have two panels? We have two to split the electric load in the house so that we have room for circuit breakers for everything at their 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 breakers for everything. At their breakers, everything, at their breakers, everything. Yeah. And it reduces the runs of smaller electric cable to the places upstairs. We can run one heavy cable over there and then at that sub panel we can take like lines out to the kitchen right and lines up to the bathroom and the second floor okay and this panel can serve the first floor on this end okay um maybe um, the outside lights the outside outlet we have an you just yeah. divide it up how it makes just sense, right? It up. And who decides that? The electrician? Uh, electrician in consult in consultation with us. Okay, with you. This is also where we'll connect the the many the heat pumps and the solar will all connect here. Yay. So we need panel space for all of that stuff down here. I am so excited about the solar, and I'm just going to start out by saying <laughs> that the the most awesome thing to me is that. We'll have solar energy coming in and then we will charge our battery driven car which has no pollution no fossil fuel burning wow. so i mean not directly but yeah. indirectly <laughs> we are we transfer it to the power generation plant or our solar panels right yeah. which we're reducing our carbon footprint because we can right and it's great it's go. great and, so, and it'll be there for a long time in the future and easily repaired even further into the future or updated or whatever happens with solar panels it's a start I hope so. yeah so when the electrician comes they will make a wiring plan with us based on where we want to put electrical outlets and where we have things like the steam shower we're going to put in and where we want light bulbs and ceiling lights and dishwashers and all that stuff they will wire the house which is now going to be easier because we have to open up the walls. So there's some lemonade. Yep. That's good stuff. It makes it easier for them to do a good job. Yay. Lemonade. Oh, wait. I'm not finished. Come back a second. And then 
As they finish putting the wires all throughout the house, they'll come down and make separate breakers for each. Yeah, is that what these are called? Separate circuit breakers. Yeah. Okay. Each one, each circuit has a circuit breaker and they will install breakers here for each of the circuits. And each circuit is a separate connection into here. That's why when the circuit breaker blows, gets overloaded, you come down here and you reset the connection. Yeah. All right, so now we have an overview of how basically houses are wired electrically. A wee tiny bit more to it. Oh, oh of course these, there is. These breakers are what are called combination breakers. They have arc fault and series fault detection on them. And then this circuit will go along until it comes to where you need to have a ground fault breaker. Which is, the are these things that you yep. push in when they blow at, at yeah, the point of contact, right? Right. It's labeled test, there it is, test. See that? That it's means... A ground, but has triggered a ground fault. There's a difference between the power and the, the neutral and the ground. Okay. It's enough to trigger that. It's very sensitive. Keep from electrocuting you. You reset it and then you're good. We're not going to do is you can put the ground fault breaker here. Yeah. Why would you do but, that? Well, it's all in one place. The okay. whole circuit is ground fault protected. Okay. But the whole circuit doesn't need to be ground fault protected. Just places like near the bathroom sink and the kitchen sink right. and places where you can reach water. something that's grounded. Right which ours won't be anyway, because we're going to use plastic pipe, so it won't be a shock hazard. But anyway, oh, these cool. things go out sometimes, the ground fault portion. And if that ground fault is right at the place, you know, like in the bathroom, then, and there's a problem with it, you can troubleshoot it easier because it's just one thing on a circuit. So if the rest of the circuit is good, you know it's not an arc fault, or a series fault in the line someplace. Somebody hasn't yet driven it and a nail through it. Sorry, I'm sorry. Someone's <laughs> probably very interested in this. Maybe we should make a master class of Mr. Jim's <laughs> house rebuilding. <laughs> make it easiest to figure out if something's wrong. You put arc fault, combination breakers in there, and then you put the ground fault at the bathroom. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Plugging her in. Plugging it in. <laughs> one kilowatt hour used. Yay! The first one of our new grand lady. <laughs> this is what Jim found in the ceiling of our house. It's a warranted union oval flask. It has this side strap on it. These were made between the 1890s and the 1920s to store alcohol. They were designed to be small and to fit inside a coat or a pocket or a handbag and to carry your whiskey around. This one has a label on it that we can't tell what, it, what was inside of it. It also has this little vent hole indicative of uh, this type of flask to let the vapors from the alcohol out. And it still has its cork. We're gonna keep this in our liquor cabinet. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> what are you doing there? <laughs> what are you doing back there, weirdo? <laughs> the slow lurker. <laughs> Nice looking hat you got there, Jim. Yeah. What's it say on there? Uh, you know. <laughs> What's it say? You know what it says. What's it say? I want to hear you say it. Certain amount of foul language. <laughs> <laughs>